Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first ever, ever webinar of CFA Society of Philippines together with Asian Institute of Management through the Jose B. Fernandez Jr. Center for Sustainable Finance and Fund Managers Association of the Philippines, featuring the re research study on assessment of the asset management industry in the Philippines, focusing on the case of the unit investment trust fund sector. Thank you for being here today. I hope you are well and safe um, during this um, pandemic. And thank you for being with us today on a Saturday morning. My name is Richelle Sampang Manao, Program Director of CFA Society Philippines, and I am your host for today's online event. Before we start, we'd like to recognize our annual corporate sponsors, our platinum sponsor, National Home Mortgage Finance Corporation, our silver sponsor, FTI Consulting Inc., and our bronze sponsors, Infinite O and Metro Bank. Please turn your attention to the screen for our housekeeping rules for today's webinar. Kindly mute your audio when not speaking to prevent any background noise. Please write your comments or questions to the speakers in a public chat space. Introduce yourselves by telling us your full name and organization. Note that this webinar will be recorded. As a background, CFA Society Philippines, in partnership with Asian Institute of Management through Jose B. Fernandez Jr. Center for Sustainable Finance and Fund Managers Association of the Philippines conducted a research paper on the status, problems, and prospects of the Unit Investment Industry Trust Fund in the Philippines. This research study is actually um, three phases. So this is the first phase the UITF, second phase would be the mutual funds, third phase would be the VULs. CFA Society Philippines has been here in the Philippines since 1997. Our vision is to be a recognized institution in the finance industry with members who are known for their integrity and professional excellence. Our mission is to lead in improving the quality and standards of the financial profession by offering educational programs, creating awareness of the significance of the CFA designation among constitu constituent groups, being an advocate on behalf of industry issues and encouraging ethical behavior for the ultimate benefit of the Philippine society. Our agenda for today is um, we will start with a welcome message from the GBF Center Executive Director and we'll be introducing our speaker, go ahead with the presentation, then panel discussion, Q&A afterwards, and then we close. To formally welcome us all, may we please have the Executive Director of AIM's Governor Jose B. Fernandez, Jr., Center for Sustainable Finance, Professor Felipe Calderon, CPA, CMA, PhD. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for taking the time to participate in today's webinar. The GBF Center is honored to have been chosen by a CFA Society Philippines to produce, to produce this study on the case of the UITF sector. Uh, this is the first phase of a three-phase study on the asset management industry in the Philippines. We also appreciate the generous support of CFA Institute and the Fund Managers Association of the Philippines in making this endeavor a possible. AIM through the JBF Center, as well as the Washington CC Graduate School of Business has been a proud partner of CFA Institute and CFA Society Philippines for many years. Our institutions have a shared mission of improving the quality and standards of the financial profession. And together we work to empower financial services professionals through research and training seminars. For this study, we tap into the expertise of one of our esteemed alumni. She is an assistant professor at the Department of Agribusiness Management and entrepreneurship, and concurrently the Associate Dean of the College of Economics and Management at the University of the Philippines at Los Baños. She was recently awarded the 2020 UPLB Outstanding Teacher Award in the junior category. She finished her bachelor's degree in agribusiness management from UPLB and her master in business administration degree from the Asian Institute of Management with distinction. She has published journal articles on topics related to agribusiness and investments. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce the author of this study, Ms. Arlene C. Gutierrez. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Professor Calderon, for that introduction. So let me now present the results of the study or the research on the assessment of the asset management industry in the Philippines, the case of the unit investment trust fund sector. So as mentioned, this is the first phase of uh, the three phases of um, asset management assessment study. So as a background, the 2018 Price Waterhouse Cooper study shows that the global asset and wealth management industry has encountered a, rap a rapid growth in assets brought about by the regulatory support, digitization, and jurisdiction-wide utilities that changed the way investment products were bought and sold in the region. In the Philippines, the trust industry experienced an asset growth in 2017, reaching a total of 3.4 trillion pesos, an up of 16% from 2016, as reported by the Central Bank of the Philippines. However, in the same year, unit investment trust funds uh, sector dropped by 8% or 768 billion pesos. Given the above, the CFA Society Philippines, in partnership with the Fund Managers Association of the Philippines, and the Asian Institute of Management, Governor Jose B. Fernandez Jr. Center for Sustainable Finance, proposed to conduct an in-depth study on the Philippine asset management industry, primarily focusing on the case of the UITF sector in the country. So these are the objectives of this particular research. The general uh, objective is to assess the status, problems, and prospects of the UITF sector in the Philippines. Specifically, the study aims to, number one, evaluate the market landscape and key characteristics of the UITF sector in the Philippines. Second, determine the current problems faced by the key players of the industry in the Philippines, assess the profile of the UITF investors in the country, evaluate the level of awareness among Filipino investors towards UITF, assess the perception among investors and non-investors towards UITF, and lastly, recommend strategies to address the challenges and weaknesses of the UITF sector in the Philippines. In order to address objectives, uh, this research particularly used this uh, analytical framework. So in order to assess the UITF sector, uh, we took a look at the supply side and the demand side of the industry. In terms of the supply side, we focus on the 25 financial institutions who are currently offering um, UITF um, in the country, assessing their current performance as well as the historical performance, strategies, clients, and problems encountered. Um, in terms of the demand side, we look at the uh, side of the uh, retail investors in particular, assessing their level of awareness, perception, and attitude. A convenient sample of 211 respondents were uh, surveyed in order to assess this particular um, aspect. So the data were assessed vis-a-vis -vis the macroeconomic factors in terms of UITF performance as well as regulations governing the industry. So to give you an overview of the trust industry in the Philippines, so as of June 2019, there are 31 financial institutions with active uh, trust operations. And these 31 um, financial institutions comprise 22% of the Philippine banking system's total assets with majority coming from the 14 universal banks. So in terms of performance, the industry grew by 14% from June 2018 to June 2019. So from 3.2 billion in 2018 to 3.7 billion in 2019. However, in terms of net income, the industry was able to realize a negative 9% year-on-year growth from 2.3 billion in 2018 to 2.6 billion in 2019. So in terms of the breakdown of the trust asset of the Philippine banking system, so um, financial assets or highly marketable financial assets still remain to be, um, uh, uh, it constitutes the majority of the industry's total assets. So looking uh, closer at the UITF industry in the Philippines, so among the 31 financial institutions in the trust industry, 20, 25 of which are offering UITF uh, products. So in terms of asset under management, um, the total EUM of uh, Philippine peso denominated UITF as of the third quarter of 2019 amounts to 658 billion pesos, 
while the total asset under management of US dollar denominated UITF as of the third quarter of 2019 amounts to 2 billion US dollars. So looking closer at the breakdown of the Philippine peso denominated UITFs according to UITF uh, type, um, it is primarily dominated by money market fund constituting 68% of the total AUM or 449 billion pesos as of the third quarter of 2019 and it uh, is followed by the equity fund with 90 billion pesos as of the same period. In terms of the trust entity provider, the top three um, in terms of AUM uh, are uh, number one, BDO Unibank Incorporated with 269 billion pesos asset under management, followed by DPI Asset Management and Trust Corporation with 198 billion pesos. And the third is Metropolitan Bank and Trust Company with 75 billion pesos. So the three actually constitute uh, the dragon share or the lion share rather of the industry. So in terms of the US dollar denominated UITFs according to UITF type, still the money market fund dominates the industry with 67% share uh, or 2 billion US dollars in terms of total AUM. And it's followed by the equity fund with 248 million US dollars. Um, same uh, with uh, the top um, trust entity providers, the US dollar denominated UITFs are still dominated by the three top banks, um, namely Bido Unibank, um, BPI AMPC, and Metropol Metropolitan Bank and Trust Company. So in terms of performance or historical performance of uh, the AUM of PESA denominated UITF from 2013 to 2018, it can be noticed that there is a negative 8% uh, average year-on-year -year growth from the uh, five-year period. So there's a fluctuating performance from this five-year period across the different types of fund, and it is primarily driven by intermediate bond funds, which realize the highest year-on-year -year decline of 44.6%, followed by long-term bond funds with 35.3% average year-on-year -year decline. In terms of the breakdown of the total AUM, of Philippine PESO denominated UITFs from 2013 to 2018. So it's consistent that the money market fund uh, dominates uh, the asset under management with an average share of 71%. Despite the negative performance of um, AUM of PESO denominated UITFs, in terms of number of accounts, it grew by an average of 15% per year with a uh, money market fund constituting the highest average growth of 26%, followed by equity fund with 17% 7 growth, uh, average growth annually. In terms of the US dollar denominated UITFs, um, historical performance, uh, it grew by 4.4% uh, annually for, for the last uh, five years, and it is primarily driven by equity fund with an average growth of 15% and money market fund with an average growth of 11%. Uh, percent. So same with the peso uh, denominated UITFs, uh, the AUM of US dollar denominated UITFs are still dominated by money market fund with an average share of 60% of the total AUM. The number of accounts, um, of US dollar denominated UITS also grew by 14% on, on average year on year and uh, was actually driven by equity fund realizing or recording the highest growth of 63% per year. So to look uh, closer at the supply side of the industry, we conducted a survey among the 25 UITF providers. So among the 25, 20 of them actually responded to the survey and these respondents include the top players in the industry in terms of AUM and were, and were mostly either chief investment officer or head of the trust operations. So in terms of the types of UIT products offered by the respondents, 100% of them or all of, all of them are offering money market fund and then 89% equity fund 
uh, same with bond fund and then 72% balance fund. So it actually explains uh, the dominance of money market fund in terms of the AUM performance as well as the um, number of accounts. So in terms of um, the UITF products that are mostly preferred by the investors, 73% of the respondents mentioned that most of their um, investors prefer money market fund. So the um, uh, UITF providers are also asked in terms of the client profiles. So they are asked on the characteristics of the majority of their uh, clients, specifically the retail investors. So in terms of sex, majority are female. In terms of annual income, so they belong to class A and class C. And then in terms of age, 80% of uh, the respondents mentioned that majority of their clients belong to the age group between 35 to 50 years old. And then in terms of profession, 35% of the respondent mentioned that majority of their clients are manager or senior officer. And in 50% of the respondents mentioned that most of their clients or majority of their clients belong to the services sector. In terms of investment profile, um, for risk appetite, 59% of the investors, uh, of the uh, UIT providers rather mentioned that their investors are mostly moderate in terms of uh, risk appetite. And then they prefer short term um, investment horizon. So basically less than three years. And they have some experience in investment. So meaning they are uh, funds, named the UITF, mutual funds, DUL, among others. And then according to the UITF providers, the primary reason for investing among the majority of their clients is to get passive income. So in terms of the, their main distribution strategy or their main channel to reach their clients, 82% uh, of the respondents mentioned that their primary uh, strategy is through the bank-based front-facing UITF marketing personnel. So this explains uh, later as we go to the demand side of that particular um, aspect. And then, um, in terms of common problems encountered with the clients, 60% of the respondents mentioned that there's a lack of understanding on the UITF products among their clients, which results to um, unsatisfaction in, uh, in terms of lower, ex lower returns than the expected okay, among clients. And then, so uh, they are also asked if there are skill gaps among UITF marketing personnel, and 55% of the respondents mentioned there is a lack of knowledge. He um, supports uh, the problems, uh, the, the major problem experienced among the clients. And then, so they are also asked, uh, what are the necessary skills uh, that are important um, for a UITF uh, personnel as perceived by the UITF providers? So 62% uh, of them mentioned that uh, knowledge on financial instruments is very, very important. And then portfolio management is also important as well as relationship management and digital. And then lastly, um, the respondents were asked to rate the trends in the UITF sector uh, on a rating from one to five with five being the highest or most important and they mentioned that BSP regulations is one of the trends that uh, is actually very important for the industry, followed by the changing demographics of Filipino investors, competition with local banks offering UIT products, and competition with VUL, as well as digital. So these are the key findings from the supply side. So the marketing strategies implemented by the trust entities are still traditional in nature. So um, as uh, supported by their strategy to, uh, or the channel by which they use to reach their clients. So there are current problems with UITF marketing personnel, and these are actually being addressed already by the revised SEC ruling, which requires a certification uh, before um, a person practice um, UITF. Um, money, money market fund dominates the industry, as can be seen from the historical performance. And the industry will be driven by, number one, steeper competition among local banks as well as other um, pooled fund investment products. 
digitization, changing demographics among clients, and more stringent uh, regulations. Now, looking at the demand side of the sector, so we did this using a survey conducted among 211 respondents. So um, just a note, uh, this cannot be actually a population of Filipino investors, but this data can serve as an indicative, um, indicative indication of the performance or uh, the perception of the investors. So among the 211, 117 are working professionals, 78 are students, 10 are entrepreneurs, and 6 are unemployed. So in terms of the profile of the respondents, majority are female. Annual income is between 200,000 to 400,000. In terms of age, 93% belong to 18 to 34 years old, which is actually in contrast majority of the pro uh, the profile of the majority of the investors according to the UITF providers belong to 35 to 50 years old. Civil status, 85% are single. So in terms of investing experience, so same majority have some knowledge, so meaning they have invested in um, pooled funds, so UITF mutual funds among others. And for the main purpose of investment, 39% cited that it's for additional source of income. And return and risk expectation, 62% mentioned that they are willing to take moderate, moderate risk in order to get moderate returns. So in terms of the familiarity on financial asset investment, so it can be noted that among the college students, 74% have zero or no, exper or no investment experience at all. So... Um, and then for the other for, for the other segments, so they have some experience, so meaning in direct investments, uh, UITF mutual fund, VUL, and managed funds. And then in terms of the level of awareness towards UITF among the respondents group, so it can be noted that 49% of the total respondents are not aware of UITFs, and it is primarily driven by uh, the college students who have 80%. Uh, oh, 80% among 80% among 80% are not aware on UITF. So, in order to assess the level of knowledge on the basic features of the UITF products among the current investors, um, the features of UITF were asked, and among those who are currently investing on uh, UITF, most of them actually got the correct answer in terms of where to go to invest on UITF, minimum initial investment required, the types of UITF available in the market, as well as the unit of measure um, of UITF. So it's a good indication among those who are currently invested on UITF. In terms of the types of UITF, uh, UITF products that the respondents are currently invested in, so 61% of them, those who are currently invested, mentioned that they are invested in equity fund. And it is actually surprising to note that only 9% of those who are currently invested in UITFs are investing in money market fund. So this is in contradiction with the supply side that majority of the uh, clients prefer a uh, money market fund as their investment. And then, in terms of the primary reason for investing in UITF, 48% uh, of the respondents mentioned that it's for capital preservation, and another 48% mentioned that it's, the, it's for growth of funds. Only 4% mentioned that it's for passive income. It's actually in contradiction as well with the supply side from the uh, perspective of the UITF providers that the ma uh, majority of their clients um, main motivation or primary reason be for passive income. And for the primary motivation for investing in UITF still um, most or sorry, it's at most, so 39% of the respondents mentioned that their primary motivation would be their banks. So they actually get the information from the banks so 22% from their family and another 22% from their peers. Okay. And then, so current investors uh, for UITF were asked, 
on the UIT, UITF teachers that they deem as important, majority of them, or 61%, mentioned that it's accessibility that they uh, see as the most important feature of UITF, followed by professional fund management. Okay. So uh, the respondents or the investors were also asked if they are willing to recommend UITF as an investment family or friends, and 96% of those who are currently invested mentioned that they are willing to recommend UITF as an investment. So these are the key findings from the demand side of the UITF sector. So it can be noted that there's a low awareness among the Filipino retail investors towards the various UITF products, and it is evident especially among the young population. There is limited knowledge among the young population towards investing and the perception that big capital is needed in order to start investing. We actually got this uh, impression from the survey that we conducted specifically from the student group or the young population group. And there's also limited, limited, limited knowledge uh, among investors towards the UATF products since majority of them have not invested or um, only, uh, they only have some um, information on UITF. But in terms of those who are currently invested, so uh, their knowledge on quite acceptable. So for the conclusion and recommendation, so these findings support the previous studies conducted on the awareness of the investors toward UITF products, as well as the underlying factors that drive the industry's uh, growth and performance. So it is suggested that the gaps between the demand and supply side of the industry must be addressed in order to fuel the growth of the sector. Um, specifically, strategy should be focused on targeting the young population and addressing the low level of awareness towards UI. These strategies include, number one, information and education drive on UITF specifically for the young population. Utilizing the digital platform to make UITFs more accessible to retail investors. Expanding the distribution channel to reach uh, a wider segment of the market. Number four, improve relationships between the UITF marketing personnel and the retail investors. Number five, product differentiation to address competition among UITF providers. And lastly, an improved incentive system must be in place in order to increase the motivation among UITF marketing personnel to understand the products as well as to relate, as well as relate to the clients better. Lastly, the support of the regulatory bodies is paramount to the success of UITFs in the Philippine capital market. An open architecture that will allow UITFs to be offered in various platforms would help the sector to increase the awareness and eventually investments among. Uh, Filipino investors. That is all. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Thank you very much for joining. My name is Stratos Kuzitakis, and I'm Director for Society Advocacy Engagement, Asia Pacific at CFA Institute. Um, today, it gives me great pleasure to attend the presentation of uh, CFA Society of Philippines uh, inaugural research on the asset management industry that was produced independently by the Center for Sustainable Finance at Asian uh, Institute of uh, 
is anything of uh, management. This research report, as it was been already mentioned, uh, reflects a culmination of approximately 12 months of research, data collection, and deep analysis. And it examines, uh, as you saw, the case of uh, unit investment trans, uh, trust fund uh, sector in the Philippines. At the same time, um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Felipe Calderon and Gutierrez for uh, this phenomenal uh, research report that they produced and all the hard work during the last 12 months. And I'm also honored because I'm uh, sitting together in a very powerful uh, panel that uh, we will discuss further on the UITF industry in the Philippines. But first things first, I would like to introduce you and welcome our panelists. So uh, first of all, we have uh, Mr. Firo Luis Amatong, Commissioner of the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, since 2014, and currently uh, Supervising Commissioner for the Markets and Securities Regulation Department and the Economic Research and Training Department. If you're welcome and thank you very much for joining. Yeah. We have Lynn Javier, Managing Director of the Policy and Specialized Supervision Subsector under the Financial Supervision Sector of Central Bank of Philippines. Lynn, welcome. Thanks for joining. Hi, good morning. Thank you. Marvin Fausto, President and CIO of COL uh, Investment Management and also founding partner of the Fund Managers Association of the Philippines, uh, who's been supporting this research report. Uh, Marvin, welcome. Thanks for joining and also thanks for all the support. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, George Ogenko, uh, CFA, who has uh, a very long, more than a decade experience in uh, insurance industry, risk, employee benefits, and social uh, security. Of course, we have uh, Professor uh, Felipe Calderon, who is uh, Executive Director at the Center for Sustainable Investment at Asian Institute of Management. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Dr. Rob Ramos, uh, Vice President at uh, East West Bank Trust Officer and Chief Investment Officer, but also Chairman and President of uh, CFA Society Philippines. Uh, hi, Rob. Thank you very much for joining and also for all your help with this report. Uh, welcome everyone and let's cut straight to the chase because we have a lot of things to discuss with regards to this uh, report. Now, UITFs were introduced in 2004 reflecting a decision of the Central Bank of Philippines to replace common trust funds and help develop the uh, capital markets in the Philippines. So, uh, Lynn, I would like to ask you if you can give us some more insights about this decision. And most importantly, we're like 16 years later. Can mm -hmm. you share your thoughts about what has been the impact in the market? Yeah, uh, thank you, Stratos. Yes, you're right that the UITF was introduced in 2004 um, with a view to eventually uh, eventually replace the CTF. So, the CTF uh, was completely phased out in 2006. This is actually a strategic resetting of the policy framework for collective investment skills that's on the part of the BSP. Our uh, ultimate objectives are to align the pricing and accounting practices with internationally recognized standards and practices. Uh, we have to institutionalize risk management and corporate governance expectations, as well as promote transparency and consumer protection. So with the introduction of UITF, we lifted some restrictive regulations, but at the same time set a higher bar in terms of corporate governance and risk management. Uh, we introduced, uh, this are, these were introduced in the form of um, the basic standards on trust and other fiduciary assets in EMA, corporate governance and risk management regulations, as well as risk disclosure statements for, for the clients. I would say that this uh, reform actually had a positive in, impact on the industry, just basing alone on the assets under management of the UITF. So at the end, uh, I'll just compare the end 2007 figures to what we have as of end 2019. So that's after the 2006 um, challenge for the UITF industry. So end 2007 AUM of the UITF is at 4 billion pesos. End 2019, it's at 820 billion pesos. This just reflects the growth of the industry as well as the, again, the positive impact of the industry of the uh, strategic setting of the policy framework for this collective investment vehicle. Thank you, Lynn. Well, if I was a journalist and I had to put a title here, I would definitely use the word ready to take off when it comes to the particular industry, if not already having taken off. Um, now, from one side, we see all these regulatory uh, introductions and clearly a booming uh, asset management industry. Well, at the same time, if we go through the breakdown of the market, we see that 
two firms uh, take the lion's share in the industry named uh, BDO and BBI, if I remember correct, we talk approximately uh, 65% uh, percent of market share. Now, I would like to ask Marvin, uh, how easy do you think it is to access the market? And especially, do you see foreign firms uh, entering and having like an appetite to enter uh, the Filipino asset management industry? Yeah, hi Stratus. Uh, you know, on the first item, it seems that the market of the UITFs are really the depositors simply because the distribution network are really the banks. And the banks are dominated by the two banks, uh, the banking industry dominated by BDO and BPI, as you mentioned. That is why uh, they have the lion's share of the UITF. So as reported by, the, by Ms. Arlene, is that the traditional distribution network is still the branching network and it's still traditional, using relationships, using the branch, uh, branch personnel, as well as uh, now catering even to the older, the older sector of the, the market, like 35 years old to 50. But uh, of late, of late, I'm quite pleased to know that simply because of this pandemic as well, no? that uh, a lot of banks are now geared or forced to gear themselves to the digital. And uh, I've, I've heard that a lot of UITFs now are, can be accessed online. But, uh, but there's a lot of work that has to be done. Uh, the market is still a deposit market, meaning much of the AUM or assets under management are still money market funds. But I'm happy to see that in terms of number of accounts, uh, the number of accounts are growing even if the AUM is not, has, has declined over the past couple of years. Uh, but uh, I see a lot of uh, potential. On your other item of, uh, you mentioned about the foreign, foreign entities coming in. I would imagine that it will be very difficult for them um, simply because of what I said, that the, the distribution network is still uh, traditional. Relationship is really very important. They really have to trust the institution that's selling their UITF to them and might be difficult for foreigners to introduce themselves as well as to get more relationship. I understand there was a foreign, foreign uh, institution before, uh, just, just a few years back, uh, I think that's ING, was able to somehow get a little bit of share in the market, uh, but, but that bank now has been sold to BPI. So, I mean, the, the UITF business has been sold to BPI. So right now you still have a lot of uh, the dominant players are just the domestic banks. Thanks, Marvin. So I guess it's safe to say that this reflects a structural landscape, but not a structural problem, fragmentation in the market. And at the same time, since we see all these new bank, uh, the, no the number of bank new accounts growing, I think this reflects an organic uh, growth. Exactly. And I mean, based on my previous, all the research on, uh, you know, how do financial hubs see uh, Southeast Asian market, like Hong Kong accessing foreign, foreign investments, looking into other Southeast Asian markets. I've always seen like Philippines rank really high as a potential uh, target market. So I guess we have exciting days uh, mm -hmm. ahead of us. Now, going okay. back to the UITF um, products, we see a, a constant comparison with uh, mutual funds and variable unit linked uh, products. So I would like to ask George and F. Firo, um, if you see any changes in this, if I may say, power play between those three products, if you see any new products being introduced that might change uh, the market landscape? And also, how do UITF stand vis-a-vis -vis, uh, variable unit links and uh, mutual funds? Uh, whom should we start with? Let's, uh, George, want to start? Hi, Stratos. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, variable unit universal life, or VUF, they are in essentially insurance product that explicitly and bundles investments and insurance components. Uh, VULs are very similar to UITF, but has an explicit insurance component. Uh, moreover, I think the key difference between VUL and UITF is that VUL are mostly sold by agency workforce um, and some financial advisors from banks. I think because of this, VUL sales are more or may have a further population reach because of how it's being sold. Uh, sometimes if it's in a bank, there are financial um, 
um, executive that, that sell or financial uh, agents that sell. But then the agency workforce of insurance company really go from house to house. So I think uh, from that perspective, VULs have a further reach in terms of population. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, George. Um, Efe, what do you, how would you position uh, UITFs vis-a-vis -vis mutual funds? Yeah, thanks uh, Stratos and uh, good morning to everyone. So right now, I think uh, uh, undeniably uh, mutual funds are in third place when it comes to collective investment schemes in the Philippines. As uh, Arlene study pointed out, UITF has the dominant share and you'll see really, really strong growth among VUL. No? And, and in response to this, to, to uh, make mutual funds a little bit more competitive with the, with the other possible uh, collective investment schemes, uh, the SEC has undertaken some reforms. Uh, one is to also allow unitized mutual funds. Um, a, a large uh, portion that we think uh, is a reason why uh, mutual funds are in, in third place is because of the cost structures around the, the mutual funds. Uh, and I think we'll get to that when, when Arlene does a, a specific and, and, the, and the Institute does a specific study on mutual funds. But, uh, SEC is trying to equalize to some extent by introducing unitization of mutual funds. It's very early. Uh, it's a very early days. There are only about a handful of mutual funds that have uh, announced a unitized structure. But we we hope that will will uh, make the costs of uh, unit uh, mutual funds more competitive. And the other thing that we are looking at is, uh, as mentioned by both George. Uh, uh, and, and Marvin a while ago, uh, really the, the VULs and the UITFs are being sold through traditional channels with, where there's already a strong sales force. Either you have the uh, branch network of the banks or you have the agent network of the, uh, of the insurance companies. One of the things we are looking at uh, really is to try to leverage on of that digitization that Marvin was talking about to see if we can reach more people uh, using uh, a less traditional uh, distribution method by using uh, things like online apps and uh, uh, digital uh, distribution of uh, uh, securities. So those are the two things we're looking at to see if we can make uh, mutual funds more competitive uh, when it comes to collective investment schemes. Thank you. Thank you, Fiamme. Clearly this will definitely change the distribution model, but I think we will discuss more about that uh, later on. By the way, uh, for all of you who, is, uh, who are attending, uh, we have a chat box. Feel free to add your, type your questions. We're reviewing them and we'll try to answer as many as possible during the discussion, but also uh, towards the end of uh, our session. Now, uh, I would like to uh, address a little bit more on uh, the current challenges faced by uh, key players and also investors in the UITF space in uh, the Philippines. Uh, starting from 2017, uh, trusts do not have access anymore to central bank uh, terms and uh, overnight uh, deposit facilities. Now, I would like to ask Lynn and Marvin uh, if you can share some more about the rationale behind this decision, and most importantly, what has been the impact in the industry? Yeah, um, the participation of the trust entities in the deposit facilities of the BSP was actually rationalized starting 2013. This was again rationalized in 2016 when we introduced the interest rate corridor system and finally prohibiting all trust um, entities from participating in deposit facilities by 2017. This is because um, the deposit facilities of the BSP are not investment outlets. They're actually policy tools being used by the Banco Central for liquidity purposes. Having said that, uh, before we prohibited the trust entity to place in the deposit facilities of the BSP, 46%, that was in 2013, of the trust assets are placed in the BSP deposit facilities, down to 10% in 2016. Um, after prohibiting them from that facility, the AUM did not contract, but growth decelerated. So, from a growth of 15.4% in 2017, it dropped to only 0.3% year on year in 2018. But that was just a um, temporary uh, setback because in 2019, growth in AUM is at 
3.9%. So a total AUM is at 3.9 trillion as of end 2019. So basically this is due to, owing to the marketing efforts of banks and this was highlighted earlier by ComF and Marvin using bank branches as distribution network helped a lot in boosting the levels of um, AUM in the industry. Thank you, Lynn. Um, yeah. Mar Marvin, your insights? Yeah, yeah. I would like to add that. Uh, so Ms. Lin already explained that maybe over the short term, the effect of using the term deposit or overnight deposit as, as an outlet for the UITF had affected the, the growth, maybe the, 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 the amount of growth the UITF uh, had in the past couple of years. But in 2019, it has improved. I think over the long run, this TDF has raised some aware awareness simply because the UITF were giving a very good yield to the depositors, no? meaning they saw now that the, that the yield that they're going to get in the UITF is much better because of the outlet that the UITF were able to participate in the central bank. Now, it raised awareness that there is such a product and also raised uh, the number of accounts. As you can see that even the AUM was affected, the number of accounts was growing. That tells me that Aside from the corporates who were using the UITF as a temporary outlet, you saw the retail investors now coming in. So I think over the long run, it's going to be good, even if it were affected, the industry was affected over the short run. Mm -hmm. Can I also ask if this is, I guess this is also in line with uh, international practices. Am I correct to assume this? Yes, on the part of the BSP, yes, that's it. That's what we uh, aligned our regulations with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, at the same time, as part of uh, you know the central bank uh, attempting to it's trying to protect investment investor uh, interests, but also promote uh, capital markets development. I know that uh, central bank requires all personnel involved in the sales of uh, UITF to be certified as uh, UITF uh, marketing personnel through a certification program administered by uh, financial service uh, industry associations and or organizations such as the Trust Officers Association of the Philippines, which are acceptable to a uh, central bank. Uh, Rob, uh, I know you have a lot of experience uh, in this area, also as a president and chairman of the uh, Society uh, Philippines. Can you share your insights about where we're standing with the ongoing uh, certification programs in Philippines? Oh, thank you, Stratos. I think First, before I give you that, let me talk to you about the certification, what is in it, what, what's part of the exam. 25% mm -hmm. of the exam is basically on UITF products um, themselves. There's 25% on the regulations and operations of the UITF, 30% on the sales process, 10% on fundamentals of investments, and the remaining 10% is code of uh, conduct and ethics. So a person has to have a 75% passing score in four out of these five modules. And if they fail one module, that score should be at least 60%. So where do we stand right now? Um, our target is to have about 10,000 to 17,000 people certified, all right? Um, by end of 2021, right now, maybe because of COVID, maybe because of a slow start, we have uh, roughly 1,096 exam takers um, for the past, for the past years. And of these 1,096, only 560 passed. So that's about 51%. Of this 51%, if you break that down, because right now you have uh, the branch people take, taking the exam, and of course the head of office people taking exam. The head office meaning the trust personnel, other people from maybe uh, wealth management selling the product. So if you break the 51%, um, the head office people out of, let's say, 317 people who've taken it, 73% or 317 pass it. So unfortunately, on the flip side of it, for the branch people, there's about 779 branch people who have taken that, that exam. And um, of that 779, 450 have failed, or that's a whopping pass rate, uh, it's a low pass rate of 42%. So that's where we stand currently. Okay. So I think the numbers are looking good, especially if you take into consideration, uh, you know, the ongoing situation with the COVID-19 saga. So just to clarify something, uh, this certification program, 
during 2020, has it been all, I mean, these certification programs, they're all also offered online? Uh, right now, what, uh, what was done in the past is that it's offered at, uh, at the Ateneo Graduate School of Business, wherein several trust, uh, members of the trust entities uh, take that exam there. And, now, um, and if they have, let's say, a testing center, they're allowed to conduct it in their own testing center. We give them a link. Because of COVID, we don't have a testing center anymore. Ateneo has said, okay, we, it's going to be hard for us to accept people who are not within the system. So we understand that completely. So we're actually asking all the trust entities to conduct the exams on their site, on their sites. So hopefully, well, to be honest with you, uh, these numbers could be better, but maybe mm -hmm. with the conduct of the uh, exams in the trust entities sites, we can push this along even during COVID times. Okay, thanks. Said that, we have an interesting question. Uh, whether uh, someone from uh, 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 SEC or maybe I would say uh, Bank Central uh, consider relaxing uh, the accreditation uh, process of the people offering mutual funds. The IC has already relaxed <laughs> given the pandemic. Uh, the BSP has allowed trust entities to certify their own personnel. Uh, can we have any comments on that from anyone from the panel? Yeah. What's our take offline? I, I think that's for me, uh, Stratos, even though it, because it's on mutual funds. Um, so I won't say that we're thinking about relaxing. Uh, in fact, uh, there, is, uh, there is legislation that's being uh, considered in Congress now about regulating ad investment advisory services. That's something that's not yet. Uh, really regulated in the Philippines uh, investment advice. So I wouldn't say we were relaxing, but what I will say is we are considering and we are on a path at the SEC towards um, uh, accrediting or recognizing uh, other, other credential giving uh, mechanisms, very similar to what Rob was describing with respect to the BSP and, uh, uh, and these uh, accreditation mechanisms. Uh, outside uh, of the regulator. So uh, the goal right now, we're, we're maybe halfway there to the goal. The goal right now is for the SEC to provide a, a baseline minimum uh, um, uh, accreditation uh, mechanism for, for mutual fund distributors or salespersons of mutual funds. But we are looking uh, to a process whereby we can uh, evaluate and possibly recognize uh, uh, accreditation by uh, private entities going forward. So not a relaxation uh, per se, uh, but a, a path to make uh, accreditation easier. Thank you, Efru. Um, uh, stay with me, please. Can I also ask what has been your interaction with the industry? Because I see that you are already working on a number of initiatives you know, to protect investors and promote transparent and uh, market development, but uh, transparency in markets development. But can you tell me a little bit more about the, your interaction with uh, industry? Yeah, uh, actually, again, we're on the fun side, so not exactly the UITF side, but uh, it's actually my colleague, uh, Commissioner Kelvin Lee and our uh, uh, director, Rachel Remalante, that has uh, regular meetings with the uh, Fund Management Association in the Philippines. Uh, and, and are working on a number of initiatives uh, to, to promote uh, mutual funds. Uh, collective investment schemes in general uh, is a high priority for the commission. It's a high priority for our chairman. Uh, and we really think this is probably the safest way for new investors to get into investment. Uh, maybe it, it, it might not be the best idea to pick your own stocks or pick your own bonds. When you're starting out, maybe taking a, a, a investing in a few mutual funds or UITFs or VULs might be the best way for a new investor to invest in a diversified portfolio uh, right away with, with with a minimum amount of uh, investment uh, on their part. Thank you, thank you, Fir. Uh, Lin, uh, would you have to add anything from your side uh, on this one on how regulators and industry work together? promoting industry yeah, um, and investor protection? Yeah, the, the BSP has regular meetings with industry associations. That's with the FMAP and the TOAP. 
And um, that's under the BSP Supervisory Policy um, Policy Committee that's being shared with the Deputy Governor. And then as far as uh, regula uh, regulators um, coordination is concerned, we, we have the Financial Sector Forum. Uh, that's the, uh, it's a voluntary interagency body comprised of the IC, the PDIC, the SEC, and the BSP, where we could also discuss cross-cutting issues across the industry and we have regular dialogues as well with the SEC. So that's how we solicit some inputs or insights on the regulatory framework of the BSP. Yeah, and, and Stratos? Stratos? Yes. Yeah, if I could just add a, a little bit to, to what Linus also said. I, I know there, there are a lot of comments and then the questions about this disparity between um, the demand side and the supply side, the, the fact that um, uh, uh, sixty eight percent of the assets under management are in money market funds, but apparently um, the the profile of the investors is actually much younger than perceived by the fund providers, and they have a more of a growth strategy uh, a, a growth goal rather than uh, a passive income uh, investment goal so I think that 's an interesting outcome of this study. Uh, I, I didn't have uh, this data before the study, and, it, and that I think that's that's uh, an area that 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 um, all the regulators might want to look at going forward. About why is that? Uh, why is there? A, a, there seems to be a, a gap between the um, between the investment options being provided by the fund providers and the goals of the uh, of the investors themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you, Fir. And I think we also had a question about this. So uh, thank you very much for addressing it. Uh, personally, I would like to say that one of the parts that I really like with this research support is that it's sitting on a very wide, a very, a very deep uh, data set. And I would like to thank each and every individual who contributed and every company who contributed to this report. And I particularly like how much in-depth uh, uh, analysis our authors have been giving with regards to the profile of uh, investors and this is something that uh, I'm pretty certain that uh, regulators would be very much interested in uh, discussing uh, further. Said that, um, I would like to go back to Arlene and uh, Dr. Calderon and ask um, about your interaction with uh, Central Bank and uh, SEC if uh, you had any further discussion about any programs or uh, initiatives that uh, are in uh, the pipeline or also, you know, how to raise awareness? Um, Strata, so far in the conduct of the study, because of the, pande uh, because of the pandemic, we were actually planning to conduct an interview with the, regul with the regulators, specifically the Banco Central ng, ng Pilipinas or the Central Bank. However, um, it was halted because of the COVID-19. So that's why we just relied on published materials regarding uh, UITFs from the uh, BSP website. Thank you, Arlene. Thanks. Well, I mean, we have two or three more reports uh, to come, and I'm sure that uh, the regulators would be also very much interested in uh, this particular one. Now, in every webinar about uh, a research report, at some point, we always use what I call the biggest academic cliche, which is challenges and opportunities. And I think we've covered opportunities quite a lot. I would like to go back to the challenges uh, currently faced by the UATF uh, market. I know that Central Bank has been trying to, to bring together and facilitate centralized storage of customer information that can be used across all financial services and other related providers, not just by the bank initiating the KYC and AML. So I would like you know, to open up a little bit, uh, see the broader picture here and ask uh, Lee, but also Rob, if you can share some more of their thoughts about ongoing regulatory challenges in the UITF market. Yeah, um, hi Stratos. Um, the, the challenges, I guess, were all highlighted in the paper of Arlene. This include awareness on the product. We should also consider the investment behavior also of the Filipino people, as well as the limited distribution channels. Currently, all the only the bank branches are having massive distribution of the UITF products. As to the from on the regulatory side, uh, I, I think um, some of these challenges have also been identified. Uh, the entry requirements, licensing requirements for distribution of UITF products, as well as the standard set. But we also have to keep in mind that while we're raising the bar 
in this um, regulatory requirements in terms of entry as well as risk management and corporate governance standards. We're also weeding out players who cannot effectively manage the product. So, but um, we hear the, the the views of the industry on this. We're currently we currently have a lot of policy initiatives in the pipeline to provide, um, I think, a varied products to the public and at the same time promote investor protection. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, Rob, what do you think? I think Any thoughts from your side? Yes, I think Lynn pretty much said it all. Um, one thing that came to light is the lack of awareness and um, being a banker for 20 plus years, you know, the thing that you do most is try to create awareness about the product, try to create awareness. So even with all of these efforts, and I believe all the, if, uh, there are a lot of bankers listening to this, I'm wondering what has come of that. I, there must be a reason why some of our efforts have not uh, pushed us to the next level. Also, I, I'm realizing when I was reading the study a few weeks back, yes, there's probably a mismatch. Are we selling actually the right products for the investors that have a particular goal, that have a different goal? Um, I understand that, as you said, and Marvin said it earlier, um, our distribution system is based on the banking system, that the, the branch banking system network. Mm -hmm. And of course, the knowledge base there is deposits. So when you move it forward, when you try to sell something, the, the first thing that you will sell that's similar to deposits is money market funds. And, guess, and, and I saw a question that's saying, why do we have more money market funds? Uh, and we have a diff and we, we are, there, there seems to be a mismatch between the goals and the investment products that clients utilize. And maybe that's it. Maybe the lack of awareness, both at the client level and maybe at the Salesforce level. And we need to do our best to push that forward. True, true. Kratos, can I yes. add something? Yes, Professor Gondoran, please. Thank you. Being a retired banker myself. Uh, uh, so I've been back temporarily back in the Philippines for three years now. I'm an expat. Vancouver's home. I'm actually joining you guys from Vancouver. So in the three years that I have been uh, at AIM, uh, and this is not, uh, I apologize in advance, my, my, the, where, I go, where I bank, I have never been approached for investment in the three years that I have been there, uh, in and out. And, and I'm surprised because when I, when I migrated to Vancouver 20 years ago, as soon as I opened my bank account, there was an appointment with an investment manager, get my risk profile, what I want to do. Every time I renew my mortgage, there's always the investment manager. Just want to share that experience. It's, I know it's, it's, not, it's anecdotal. I cannot generalize it. It's one experience, but I, I'm, I'm surprised because as a banker, we're used to selling, right? Every opportunity, we want to sell something. And it's, it's been three years. Felipe, I'll, I'll call you after this. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, well, which actually brings us to uh, a question that I would like to do uh, most likely to uh, Arlene, but also ask the insights from the rest of the panel. Um, I, find, uh, I found a very interesting contrast in the report. So Arlene, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I see that we have 75% of respondents claiming that they do have some knowledge or that they are generally knowledgeable about investments, while 75% also responded that they have never heard or don't know how UITFs work. I don't think that this reflects some kind of uh, statistical error because I know that your sample has been very good. So I would like to ask if there is any gap here. And of course, how, if yes, how can we address it? Um, I think it's actually product specific because when you ask um, investors, specifically the young ones, since my sample is actually dominated by the young population, they are more familiar with uh, the more popular types of investments, like for example, equity, stocks, bonds, uh, mutual funds for that matter. But when you're asked, uh, when they are asked if they are familiar with uh, UITF, maybe some of them will say that they have heard the term. But in terms of um, if they understood or understand how UITF works, most of them will say that they have no idea. So they don't know how UITF will work or works. Thank you. Professor Calderon, does this answer, uh, that, do you think that this is related also to your uh, uh, own observation? Yes, and I'm, I'm not sure whether in, is our, educa our educational system, does it include personal planning? 
Mm -hmm. our, our, our kids are educated at early age about you know, what are the products out there about savings. So maybe that, that's maybe that's one thing that we'll probably have to during the and the next phase we'll probably look into that too. I mean that's definitely an area that we should look. I fear uh, any thoughts from your side? Yeah, um, I, I have a, I have two uh, anecdotes that support uh, Professor Calderon's anecdote. Um, I used to I used to work in the provinces. I used to work in Zamboanga del Norte for four years, and uh, I when I was when I was much younger, and, and I was I was looking as a young person to invest in, in something that could grow. And I walked into two two banks, and there are actually ten banks. There were ten banks this is in the early nineties in the uh, in the provinces. I walked into three branches of the banks there, asking to invest in CTFs. There were no UITFs here. There were common trust funds. And the, the branches didn't know anything about common trust funds. Uh, and, and they were trying to offer me time deposit products. And I say, no, no, I, I would like to invest in common trust funds. I read in the paper, they're a good investment. Uh, I have a, a higher risk uh, tolerance since I'm still a young person. I was in my early 20s. I'd like to invest in CDF. And, and no one in three branches of large banks uh, in the provinces had any idea what I was talking about. Uh, and, and, and to give another uh, uh, similar, um, similar uh, but more updated anecdote, I teach a, a, a master's class at the, the University of Philippines College of Law on uh, cross-border uh, investment transactions. And um, my class, it's not a class of 16, are all professionals, some very senior uh, experienced lawyers. And I asked them, you know, uh, are you aware of uh, some of these uh, competing bank products to, to what's available on the capital markets? Like for example, uh, long-term negotiable certificates of deposit or unit investment trust funds. And some of them go, uh, I've never heard of them, and I'm like, these are very senior, senior partner level persons uh, mm -hmm. uh, who who have not been approached with these products. So it's anecdotal, but uh, it seems to support uh, uh, the findings of the study, as uh, as well as uh, Professor Calderon's uh, 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 example. And I, I I would second Rob's observation that. Maybe there's something wrong here. Why, why aren't these products being more, uh, offered more uh, towards potential investors? Or why isn't the message getting across to mm -hmm. potential investors if, in fact, they are being offered? So I don't know. It's all anecdotal, but the study seems to support. But this is uh, Stratus, Stratus, I'd like to answer that. I'd like to okay. answer that. Yes. Uh, yes Stratus, there, there are a lot of discussions on the awareness and the... I mean, the reason why you're not being uh, offered, there's a very basic reason for all of this. Uh, because banks are being run for profit, basically. And of course, the way they, they prioritize products, they prioritize the one that really makes them more. Now, it is a fact that UITF only earns you like 1% in management fee or half percent for your money market. And that the, and the, the branch, branch personnel are not really incentivized to sell this simply because uh, they are paid by salary and they have their own targets to meet, sell their credit card, their loans, their deposit products. The UITF somehow lands on somewhere in the last <laughs> product that they would want to sell simply because uh, the, the, the product is also volatile, meaning if you invest in the equities market, that thing can go up and down. It can lose money for the client. So this is the very basic principle of priorities of the bank in terms of selling products, the one, the one more profitable one would naturally be the one being offered to Dr. Calderon and even to, to, the, uh, to uh, Commissioner F in the provinces. It's going to be the credit card, the loans, the deposits. The UITF, it will be secondary. So I think that is the one uh, that really stops the, the uh, incentive to, to tell customers or even to be, make them aware of the products and services. And maybe that's, that's the one we can look at later on. And maybe see if, if you can, and, and maybe our, our, uh, somebody from IC can confirm that, the VOLs, the ones selling the VOLs are incentivized. In meaning these, these agents, are, they sell it by, for commission. So there is really a, a, a reason why VOLs are more, more, more 
uh, more uh, attractive rather than, or more people are more uh, buy more viewers rather than view ITFs. So I guess it's really very basic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would be interested at some point to see further the levels of awareness uh, on the EU ITF products among those who sell uh, UITF's uh, products. But talking about uh, market development on the UITF, we have a question about whether uh, Central Bank or SEC uh, are considering any revisions on the regulations or easing restrictions in terms of fund management of uh, UITFs. For example, lifting the 15% uh, single borrowers limit uh, in investment exposures and others. So, uh, Lynn, uh, if there any uh, updates, something that you can share? Yeah, for this one, Stratos, we already received a request from the industry to review this one. This is part of the initiatives that we have in the pipeline. So we have yet to complete the review, but we're revisiting the 15% exposure limit for UITFs. Mm -hmm. Good to know. Good to know. If here? Um, I, again, this is for mutual funds, not exactly UITFs, but uh, uh, as of now, I'm not aware of any move on the part of the SEC to re reconsider the um, investment limits, uh, concentration limits. But but that those are concentration limits on on particular, like for example, it's not a necessary limit on on equity investments. It's e limit on equity investments in company A. So, I, I, offhand, I don't see that being a a major constraint. Thank you, thank you, Fear. Now. Uh, Marvin, I would like to uh, go back to a, an issue that we raised a couple of times, but not really touched uh, in depth. Um, I would like to learn a little bit more about how to focus on young people. Uh, but actually, before that, uh, let me ask Arlene if uh, Arlene, if you can sketch a little bit more on the profile of young people with regards to the risk appetite and the level uh, of awareness. Um, in terms of uh, the respondents from uh, our survey, since most of them are working professionals, uh, working in uh, NCR, the National Capital Region, and Region 4A. So mm -hmm. if, in terms of characteristics, they are more um, into digital, digitaliz digitization. So in terms of channel, I think the more digital, the more accessible, the more it is fitting to this uh, population. And in, their, in terms of the students, I think knowledge-wise, it's very limited So, uh, in terms of investment. But the working professionals are gearing towards uh, looking into investment products or financial assets. So, Marvin, let me get back to you. How do we raise awareness within this particular segment of uh, clients? Uh, do you think that there is or there should be a specific strategy Yes, um, I think the study just was done last year, 2019. So it was more or less needed some a bit of updating simply because we have all of this pandemic. And I think all the banks were kind of pushed to do digital, digital, digital efforts. Now, in order to increase awareness, the digital efforts is really number one. And you can see this in the COL in our company and also in the seed box and all of those companies that are getting into the digital network. And we have seen uh, tremendous growth in terms of uh, growth in, in, uh, in accounts, particularly, more particularly the past couple of months or during the GCQ, during the, the lockdown, where, where, the, where the awareness has increased into, in using digital network. Now, it's another thing that the, the, the demand side would like, but one another thing is what the suppliers are doing i guess the banks are just have their hands full in trying to prioritize certain digital efforts more particularly in the payment schemes and the in the in the loans in the deposits i guess in terms of priority it will follow uh i would like to give an example on the gen z's um and the gen and then the one the millennials the millennials I understand are now, now the biggest part of the, the customer base of, of uh, UITS, but the millennials are the ones that are YOLOs and FOMOs, meaning they, 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 look, uh, they value more uh, on uh, experiences and traveling, et cetera, and spending. 
but the Gen Zs, the, the younger ones that you were talking about, the younger ones, the, the, one, the, the, one, the Gen Zs, are now seeing the millennials. I've, I've seen a study saying that they see that the millennials are, are just spending a lot of money and they're saving less. Now, the Gen Zs, I understand, are now saving more simply because of learning from the experience of the millennials. And now they are more uh, tech savvy, they are more uh, uh, digital human beings, but they only have less in terms of uh, income because of their startup. Now, I guess there's a lot of potential for that, a lot of ways that the banks will have to restructure or change the way they bank uh, UITF. It has, it has to be like more of a uh, relatable, not, not too many words, or there has to be a lot of uh, um, Instagrammable ways or Facebook ways in order to reach this, pro re reach this market segment. That is a very good, strong potential for the UITF. Mm -hmm. Do you see any other uh, important demographic trends uh, that could shape the future of the industry? Yeah, uh, the demographic trends are now that the, 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 the investors are now moving to more of the entrepreneurs. They're having their own businesses, their online businesses, they're, they're becoming entrepreneurs and they're becoming self, self uh, they look at their own futures for themselves. They're not employees. In other words, that, that the demographic movement from the employee's mindset to become entrepreneurs are now thinking about themselves, thinking about their future. So thinking about what will happen to them when they grow old or what will, they have to plan for the future. So that, that, that is a very good, uh, that is a very ideal market for UITF simply because you want to offer them products that will benefit them in the future. So for, especially for the entrepreneurs and, and the ones that are doing digital uh, businesses right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Marvin. George, I know that uh, the insurance industry is also moving very actively into demographic uh, trends. Uh, can you also tell us, I mean, if you are focusing on any particular ones? All right. Um, thank you for that, Stratos. Uh, the Philippines is a young population, but it's definitely aging. Uh, that said, the demand to provide security for personal retirement will only increase in the future more so because the social security pension that we have currently will not be sufficient. We probably have a pension of about 16,000 per month. And then personal savings through UITF, mutual funds, VULs, will really help address this demand. The Insurance Commission is seeing a shift right now as to your point strategies in insurance product, more into health and wellness. For because of the new insurance accounting standard, IFRS 17, the VUL landscape is anticipated to have even more health products. So we really see that uh, the insurance player are catering to demand on health and wellness nowadays. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, George. Now, we haven't talked upon uh, one of the hottest topics, if not the hottest topics these days, and that would be uh, ESG and uh, UITFs. Uh, Philippe, uh, can you share some more? Yes, I think that the timing is perfect, uh, especially if you want to attract the younger generation. Uh, sustainability, climate change, these issues are now more mainstream. Mm -hmm. I think there's an, uh, the timing is perfect to issue uh, UITs that, UITFs that, are, that invest in companies that are more, that practice more environmental and social and governance uh, best practices. I think the timing is perfect. SEC recently required uh, publicly listed companies to produce uh, the sustainability reports. Banco Central uh, two months ago announced the uh, sustainable finance framework. I think everything is happening. I think that, that maybe that is one way to attract this younger generation because they share this, this type of values. And that's how I see it. Thank you, okay. thank you. Uh, do, do you see also, uh... I mean, and pardon my lack of knowledge, also thematic uh, UITFs? I, I, I did one quick uh, uh, search, a BDO issued what, a few years ago. Okay, okay. Uh, maybe it's maybe too early for its time. Maybe it's too early. I mean, we usually start with uh, ESG uh, integration and uh, definitely this can be a very good tool, among others, to approach young generation where ESG is particularly uh, popular 
among uh, yeah, young investors. Now, uh, Marvin, you uh, mentioned uh, digit uh, digitization earlier. So I think we also have a couple of questions at that front. So I would like to ask you, uh, you and the rest of the panelists, um, how do you see digital innovation challenging or not the traditional distribution model of uh, UITFs? And do you see any particular trends in the uh, Philippines? Maybe we can start with Marvin, who brought this up uh, just now. Yeah, yeah. I think the banks will be disrupted if they don't act fast enough. Uh, we, are, you, we already see the banks being disrupted by the lending and all the other uh, digital wallets that's coming out. And um, distribution of UITF is uh, just around the corner. I, I think the central bank is opening it up You're using uh, open architecture. And uh, a mutual fund also is the, allowing uh, other distributors to do that, more particularly in the online. And I guess, uh, and I'm just very happy to, for, to announce that I think uh, the SEC has, has already released a draft allowing uh, those, those 50,000 and below uh, investors to have less KYC requirements, no face-to-face -face anymore. I mean, this, this innovation can help a lot more people to do uh, things online. So I, I guess uh, if you don't really change, you don't really uh, move, uh, reprioritize your uh, your uh, capital expenditures on IT, mm -hmm. I, I, you, might, you might be left behind. So now we live in a, in a situation where the interest rates are really very low. Uh, depositors are not going to get much anything anymore in their bank accounts, meaning it's even less than 10 years now, it's only 2.8%, 10-year bond. So it's really very, very low. And we see that trend to continue for the foreseeable future because of what's happened. So we see that there's a much opportunity for investments more particularly long-term investment that will give you higher yielding returns and the UITFs and even the other collective investment schemes can provide that. And now is a chance for us to do digital and offer it to the younger generation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marvin. Uh, Esther, do you see any challenges uh, in this process? Uh, there are many challenges, <laughs> but, but uh, uh, mainly because, you know, we've, uh, We've always been used to our paper-based uh, mechanisms. We've been used to face-to-face. -face. It's, it's the way we've done business for a very long time, even on the part of the regulator. But as Marvin has mentioned, you know, uh, we all need to catch up. And I think this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, which, which has really restricted face-to-face -face contact and put an emphasis on, on online transactions, is really something that's motivating us to, to do the extra steps uh, necessary uh, to make uh, uh, online transactions uh, viable. And, and on the part of the SEC, we're, we're actually uh, just playing catch up with the BSP. The BSP uh, already have has regulation on, on tiered KYC or risk-based uh, know your customer onboarding mechanisms. We at the SEC are, are playing catch up. As, as Marvin mentioned, we've put up a uh, regulation for comment for simplified onboarding uh, without face-to-face -face for lower risk uh, clients, those who are investing 50,000 and below. So these are the steps that we're, we're taking, but there's, it, there's, there's a long way to go still uh, to, to make it viable. But, but uh, I don't think we have a choice anymore with uh, the reality of COVID-19. We, we really have to look at enabling uh, digital uh, platforms. Thanks, Safir. Actually, you mentioned something that was also raised by one of our uh, attendees and um, reading a question, uh, if to push, to push uh, digitization, the challenge is the regulator's requirement, specifically on KYC, requiring a face-to-face -face verification. So, uh, Will a uh, central bank consider easing on the KYC as well, especially for those who are already clients of a bank? Uh, Lee, oh, would you yeah, like yeah, to take this? You, we, we, as mentioned by COMF, we already have a tiered framework for KYC. You could actually open a UITF account without any face-to-face -face contact. And um, just to weigh in on the previous question, the pandemic actually accelerated the digitalization of the not only of the industry, but the BSP as well. So we are also um, rolling out initiatives to digitalize retail payments and the financial services in the industry. 
And then um, for, for the open architecture, as, uh, as mentioned by Marvin, we're taking a hard look at this because there are statutory limitations. But the objective is to expand the distribution channels uh, and effectively, still effectively complying with the law. So we're, we're looking at uh, this area as well. Thank you, Lynn. George, I know that uh, also uh, the insurance sector has been uh, undergoing a massive uh, digital uh, innovation process. So can you also share uh, some of your thoughts and insights about uh, how does digital innovation can challenge traditional distribution models of those products? Yeah, I'm, I echo what COMF mentioned that uh, similar to them, insurance is generally uh, catching up with, uh, with the banking industry. Uh, they're, they're definitely more ahead. But because of this pandemic, the Insurance Commission was forced to look into the digital landscape in terms of submissions, uh, in terms of InsurTech. Um, right now, we have allowed um, agents uh, to sell to their clients without face-to-face -face using digital technology. We've also allowed the use of digital uh, payments. And we've also allowed certain leeway in terms of for new agents, not necessarily requiring uh, insurance commission examination. So we have uh, we've joined the bandwagon in terms of making it easier and using the digital platform. Uh, moreover, uh, the insurance commission has already released guidelines on regulatory sandbox to support the insure tech initiatives that many of the insurance players are clamoring for. Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, we don't have much time, but I, I would like to go back to the question, to the report. And there was this part that uh, particularly intrigued me. So uh, quoting directly from the report, uh, questions, uh, constraints, constraints must be addressed in order for the industry to realize this future growth. These include opening up the UITF industry to more flexible regulations and more asset classes that will be allowed by Central Bank of the Philippines. I'm just thinking potentially uh, real estate might be one of those asset classes. Um, Aline, uh, can you, do you have any comments on this uh, part? Not directly on the real estate suggestion, but probably on the policy the, uh, um, initiatives of the BSP, we, we have this what we call as a trust business model and the UITF regulations preview is part of this one. Uh, I've mentioned earlier that we'll be streamlining licensing for UITF uh, products, anchoring on the capacity of the trust institution to manage the product and the risk and also to protect consumers. We're looking at the cross-selling framework and we also wanted to adhere to the IOSCO principles on collective investment. This would, um, again, promote accountability in the industry uh, to, to their clients, as well as adhere to good corporate governance and risk management practice practices. So uh, the investment outlets that would form part of the review in general of the, the UITF regulations. Thank you, Lynn. And going uh, a little bit further with, this, with uh, this particular paragraph of the report, uh, again, I'm quoting, other pressing trends that must be addressed by the industry players include competition with local UITF providers and competition with uh, variable unit linked products. So George, can you, uh, can you tell us what do you see ahead down the road vis-a-vis uh, -vis the competition between uh, UITF and variable unit linked products? Um, thank you, Stratos. I think there was a question earlier on collective investment scheme, which was already also discussed by COMF. I think there are two schools of thought on that area. Number one is uh, different regulators, but the same framework uh, as is the current scheme right now, or you just have one master regulator um, handling UITFs, BULs, and mutual funds. I think it's, uh, uh, there are nuances among the different uh, funds, but definitely, uh, a discussion among industry players and with our Congress will definitely help move us forward in terms of what direction we want to take. Currently, the IC right now um, is beefing up the VUL guidelines right now. Even the proposal schemes, we're trying to beef that up. We were just hampered by the COVID-19 pandemic. So it might come up later this year or early next year. So our updated VUL guidelines. Thank you. Thanks, George. Thank you so much. Uh, we are almost run out of time. So uh, instead of adding any concluding remarks, I would like to ask our panel experts 
uh, any last thoughts on what can be done, what should we do to further promote the UITF industry together with investor uh, interests? I think I can chime in on that, Stratos. Um, first thing that I see is from the banking sector, uh, synchronization. What do I mean by that? Um, now it's digital, it may be easier. I'm opening an account. Um, let's say I have to open a credit card account. I have to open a um, savings account or checking account. I have to fill up so many forms and I want to open a UITF account. So if I can integrate all of that, um, put it in you know, one window or one form of document, it would make things easier for me. I think that's one, I think that's one big uh, uh, hurdle that we can eliminate. Hopefully with the, being in a digital space, we can make things easier for the client. The second, and obviously it's here, you know, I'm, I've listened to F, I've listened to Felipe, and I'm hearing that these guys who are senior, uh, people should be coming to them. Maybe the incentive scheme or the payment scheme, it's something that we can reconsider. Uh, if we want to push this product or promote this product, then we should put you know, more skin in the game. That's one. I know it's not possible across uh, the room or up across the industry, but there must be something done to promote the products, considering it does so much good for a lot of investors. I think that, that's my two cents. Thank you so much, Rob. Uh, any last minute comments or shall we yeah. get back to Rob again? Okay. Yes. Yes, Marvin. Yeah, yeah. I just like to say that um, uh, the total collaboration between the regulators, industry players, as well as investors should be put primordial. Uh, we are all serving just one customer, and that's the Filipino investor. We want to serve him and serve him to have a better future. I guess that is the primordial concern, and all of us should work together. In other words, the IC, the SEC, the central bank industry players should work hand in hand. Uh, not, not specifically uh, on a uh, per regulator basis, but more of a combined effort. Uh, I know that there's a, there's a law that's going to, uh, it's been drafted, the uh, Collective Investment Scheme Law, but that thing is going to take a while before it comes out for, to, to unite all the three regulators. But hopefully we can work together, uh, the industry as well as the regulators to come up with, with products and services and even incentive schemes or cost structures mm -hmm. or regulatory, uh, regulatory framework that is aligned to everybody. Not, not, not one come up with that regulation and then copied by another one and then another one. It's, it's a, some kind of a unified effort, if I may request, so that we can all serve the Filipino customer for their better future. Thank you. Thanks, Marvin. Breaking silos is indeed uh, no, the key, one of the keys towards further uh, capital market development. Well, um, if there are no further comments, I would like to thank all our panel experts for taking the time and also sharing uh, all the wisdom in this particular uh, uh, market uh, sector. Uh, I would like to pass it back to Rob for uh, his concluding remarks. So uh, I'd like to thank everybody, uh, to our panelists, all of you. It was a pleasure to have worked with you. Stratos, you know, Thank you for doing such a great job moderating for our secretariat. Thank you for putting this event together. Uh, of course, um, AIM, the Governor Jose B. Fernandez uh, Center for, uh, for Sustainable Finance and FMAP for your contributions. Um, remember, ladies and gentlemen, this is just the first of uh, three studies. So I hope uh, with your help, we can finish the job. We'll be studying mutual funds and BULs next. And we hope that you can join us uh, for these next two events. So with that, thank you very much for all your help. Thank you, Rob. Rizal, any further uh, announcements? Hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. Um, again, we are grateful for everyone, uh, for our moderator, for our panelists, for being with us today. It was a very fruitful discussion. And uh, we sincerely appreciate also the time and effort of all of our participants in today's webinar. 
And uh, we'd like to announce that we will be providing the completed research study to all of our participants. Um, we'll provide you the link where you can download the research study. And we would also be sending the three-minute evaluation form because we value your feedback. We'd like to learn how we can improve our webinars further. In addition to that, we'd like to announce that we do have um, an SEC accredited corporate governance um, workshop which can earn four CG credits to the attendees. That's our ethical decision making workshop. So for those who would like to learn more about that, please send an email to events at cfaphilippines.org or you may just um, contact me. And uh, with that, we conclude our today's webinar. Um, again, thank you very much for everyone who joined us today. Keep safe, everyone. And we hope to see you again in our next um, webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you everyone. Much, thank you. Everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Safe.